and was published a couple weeks ago. And it contains our best guess, about 99.3% of the human genome. And it still has about 343 gaps. They're, you know, we know where they are, we know what they are, but, but they're not sequenceable with current technologies. That's the, quote, finished human genome. What is it like? Well, this is a picture of a genome. Do we have a pointer? Let's see here, we do have a pointer. Uh, this is your genome here. This is chromosome number 11. And I'll call attention to some interesting bits. So these colored lines here represent genes or gene predictions based on uh, both sequencing of cDNAs and mapping them back to the genome as well as computer programs that analyze the genome. And uh, they're, they're, right here you have a big pile up, lots of genes. Very few genes over here. Lots of genes and few genes. Notice that the places where there are lots of genes match up with, the, with these light gray bands, which are the light gray bands in the microscope on chromosomes. The places with very few genes match up with the dark bands in the chromosome. Now, do you know why that is, that the gene-rich regions are these chromosome light bands and the gene-poor regions of the chromosome dark bands? Me neither. Nobody, nobody has a clue. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, it's just one of these things. We had no reason to expect that we'd see these striking patterns. And other genomes, E. coli, doesn't have this dense urban cluster and these big rural plains that are gene poor. This is, this is very weird. Um, and it's distinctive to mammals. Uh, you'll also notice that the gene-rich regions here are rich in Gs and Cs. They have different distributions of some repeat elements. There's all sorts of weirdness that just comes from looking at the genome. The biggest weirdness was the number of genes. The count of genes is our best guess, about 22,500 genes. If I had to pick a number today, it would be our count of genes. And of course, that's down from the 100,000 that was in some textbooks, and it's down even from the 30 to 40,000 that was in the genome paper of February of 2001. Our best guess is that it's really just about that range. Now, the genes themselves are very interesting. When you look at, you know, if, if we only have 22,000 genes, you know, what do we, how do we manage to, to run a human being with so few genes? It is, by the way, probably fewer genes than the mustard weed Arabidopsis thaliana has. So what do we do? Well, humans, uh, one, one thing we may take comfort in is that we, although we only have about 22,000 genes, there's a lot of alternative splicing. And on average, a typical gene, on average, has about two alternative splice products. Some have many, some have few. But probably, when you're all done, those 22,000 genes may encode 70, 80,000 different proteins. And it could be more than that, because we don't know all the alternative splice products and, and what they do. Uh, but if you ask, are, you know, are, can humans get credit for being uh, really inventive or creative, for having lots of new genes that make us human? The answer is no. Not only are humans not different in their gene complement from other mammals, mammals as a group really haven't invented that much when you get down to it. Most of the recognizable subdomains of proteins, proteins are built up of subdomains, recognizable sequences that have certain motifs that fold up in certain ways or carry out certain enzymatic functions. And it looks like our genomes, our genes, are mix and match combinations of many domains that were invented a long time ago in invertebrates and before, and that most of evolutionary innovation in the more complex multicellular animals has simply been mixing and matching these, these domains in new ways to get slightly different functions. You don't get a lot of points for creativity, but it does seem to work. Now, by far the most derivative of all, and what characterizes our genome tremendously, is when a gene works, make extra copies of it and let it diverge slightly and take up new functions. Really, your genome is just characterized by large expansions of families, immunoglobulin-like genes, intermediate filament proteins holding together the cytoskeleton. There are 111 different keratin-like genes in your genome. They're all different. They do different things. But they all came from one gene that was copied, copied, copied at random, randomly duplicated, and then diverged to take up new functions. Uh, growth factors. Flies and worms manage to get by just fine, thank you, with two growth factors of the TGF beta class, whatever that is. You have 42 growth factors of this TGF beta class, all of which help communicate, like cells communicate in different ways. And then, of course, olfactory receptors. Uh, in your genome, you have about a thousand genes for olfactory, for smell receptors. This is what uh, Richard Axel and Linda Buck won a Nobel Prize for uh, this year. 
was their work on olfactory receptors. Um, sad to say, though, out of your 1,000 olfactory receptors, genes, most of them are broken. They're mostly pseudogenes. Um, it's not true in dogs and mice who keep their olfactory receptor genes in pretty fine working order, but it's very clear that in primates with color vision, our olfactory receptor genes have been going to seed. They have been piling up mutations, and there's no selective pressure to keep many of them. And in fact, we've now shown, in a paper that'll come out soon, that this process is accelerating dramatically in the last seven million years since we diverged from chimps. And so humans have almost completely lost interest in smell. That's not totally true. Some of these olfactory receptors surely matter for various processes, but most of them are probably irrelevant right now. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the nature of the genes there. Another interesting fact that's worth mentioning about your genome is half of your genome consists of transposable elements, elements that simply duplicate themselves and hop around the genome, elements that are like viruses. They make a copy sometimes into RNA. The RNA is copied back into DNA and slammed elsewhere in your genome. Uh, these elements, well, the, there are four classes, alu elements, uh, line elements, retrovirus-like elements. All of these go through RNA intermediates and use reverse transcription. And then there's certain DNA transposons that go through a DNA intermediate. The number of copies of the alu element, the alu element that this hopped around your genome is about a million. You have a million fossils of this element that's hopping. You say, why is it there? And the answer is, because it's there. Because anything that knows how to make a copy of itself and insert itself in your genome, you can't get rid of. You could consider it, if you wish, an infection. But half of your genome consists of an infection with these kinds of transposable elements. Now, that said, yes? Well, it's very interesting. Um, what's the effect? Well, they do, some of them are transcribed, and uh, it's, it's very interesting. Sometimes it's bad. One of them will hop into a gene and mutate it, and that's bad, and that, that person will have a lethal mutation. But uh, the genome has probably begun to use them and, and, and uh, count on their being there. So when a bunch, when a transposable one goes in and creates a spacing, if you, if, for example, if, a, if an engineering committee came in and cleaned up the genome by getting rid of all the transposable elements, it would surely not work because we have evolutionarily come to count on the spacing there. Sort of like if, if in, your, uh, in some very um, messy attic, you put a cup of coffee down on top of a stack of papers. Those papers may be utterly irrelevant, but now they're holding up that cup of coffee that you've put down on it. And if, and if you were to just poof, magically get rid of them, the cup of coffee would come crashing to the ground.